recognize it. You probably recognize the songs, but there are two songs there. Uh, Take my life and let it be consecrated, and I surrender all. And uh, it's interesting. I, I'm not a musician as such, but uh, the way they arrange music, uh, the way she played it, I, um, the, 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 the words, take my life and let it be consecrated, and I surrender all, sometimes we fight against God. And the way the music was played was say, okay, subdue yourself, surrender yourself, be uh, submissive to Christ, be submissive to God, and consecrate your life uh, to Him. Uh, stop fighting. And the way the music was, just say, okay, relax. <laughs> stop fighting against God. Thank you, Jerry, for that. Let's go to our Bibles and go to Luke chapter 23. We've been going over words. She was excited. She was ready to go, Jerry. You didn't know she turned, came running up here, did you? Yeah. <laughs> she, did, she, did she say go, Grandma? Yeah. Okay, that's, that's what I thought. <laughs> Luke chapter 23, we've been going over certain words out of Scripture, and I want to take you to actually three words this morning that we're going to look at. And uh, we find one, the first one, in Luke 23, and we're going to look at verse number 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Just that verse. And the, ver the word we're going to look at is Calvary. This is not cavalry. This is, people get those two words mixed up. Cavalry are, are uh, uh, soldiers on horses, okay? Today they have a cavalry in the army, but it, they're not on horses. But uh, uh, that's cavalry in C-A-V. This is Calvary, C-A-L. Calvary, and we want to look at this word. Have you ever noticed how many churches have the name Calvary in their in their name? Let me read some. These are real churches, just and nothing weird, but just <laughs> they're real churches. Calvary Baptist Church, Calvary Chapel, Calvary Church, Calvary Community Church, Calvary Lutheran Church, Calvary Bible Church. There's probably a lot more, but they put the word Calvary in there. Why? Because that is where Jesus was crucified. If you look through the scripture, you find, we, we sing a song called uh, The Old Rugged Cross. The very first part of that, that song says, on a hill far away uh, stood an old rugged cross. Now, the Bible doesn't say there was a hill. The probability is there was a hill, and we'll, we'll mention that as we go along, but uh, uh, it, the Bible does not say there's a hill. But the word Calvary has a certain meaning, and I'm gonna, we're going to look at that because uh, we find the word several places in Scripture. And this is the only place where it is translated Calvary. Okay? Um, look over at Matthew chapter 27. We're going to look at three places in the Old, New Testament. Matthew 27 and verse number 33. Matthew 27, 33. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull. The word Golgotha is, uh, uh, is a Hebrew word. We'll see that. Let's, let's go on and, we'll, and John will tell us that. Look over at Mark chapter 15. So we see Golgotha there in, in Matthew. And in Mark chapter 15... And verse number 22. And they bring him unto the place Golgotha, which is, being interpreted, the place of a skull. And now go over to the book of John, chapter 19. John chapter 19 and verse number 17. And he, that's Jesus, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew, Golgotha. The word Golgotha is the Hebrew word, and it, it's translated here from the word Golgotha. 
it's not really translated, it's transliterated, just Golgotha, it's a Hebrew word. Actually, here it's, it's the Greek rendition of the Hebrew word Golgoleth. Okay, we'll look at that in a minute. But in each place here, as, in, as we're looking at where Jesus was crucified, it was called Calvary. It was also called Golgotha. Golgotha, the Hebrew word, as I said, Golgoleth, and it means skull or head. Gol Golgotha. Uh, so in each of these places we looked at, it tells us that it's the place of a skull. The word skull, if we go back, um, the word skull in, in Greek, as you look at even John chapter uh, 19, verse number 17, which says the place of a skull, that word skull is the Greek word cranion. Now I'm doing all of this because I want, to, I want you to, when we go to the scripture and we, and we see these words, uh, we just take them for words and not really thinking about them. But there's a purpose that God put them in there. And the word cranion is where we get our word cranium. Okay? And what's our cranium? Our skull, right? So cranion is found in Luke chapter 23, the word, the place where we started, Luke chapter 23, and look at, again at verse number 33. When they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. You don't see skull there. It's the word Calvary. The word Calvary is the word, the, um, it's a Greek word, um, cranion. But in Latin, it is translated as Calvaria. And so that's why then the translators used the Latin translation of the Greek and changed it into an English word, Calvary. Don't ask me why they did it that way. But it shows us that it's the same place. It's the place of a skull, cranion. What theologians have come to accept is that the place of Christ's crucifixion was on a hill outside of Jerusalem. And the reason they do that is because outside of the Jerusalem, there is a place that has a uh, formation on the side of the hill that kind of looks like a skull. And that is probably where it came, it got its name. And there's no proof of that. There's no proof that that was the place where Jesus was crucified. But there is a garden close by and uh, things that indicate that was the place. But we're looking at, at Calvary. Calvary, the word uh, Golgotha or Golgoleth. I want you to go to the book of Numbers in the Old Testament. And we might not, because of our language, we, we look at things in English and we don't see it. But look at Numbers chapter 1. And look at verse number two. Now this the book of book is called the book of Numbers, and that's where God counts certain families and how many people are in certain families. Look at verse two. It says, "Take ye the sum of all the congregation of the children of Israel, after their families, by the house of their fathers, with the number of their names, every male by their poles." We look at that word poles, and. Uh, we might think, well, is, where, where do I hear that today? Probably when we go vote. You go to a polling place, right? Well, that's the reason they call it a polling place is because of this word back from the time of, of well, the time of uh, Shakespeare, 18, 1611. The word polls here in Numbers 1-2 is the word Golgoleth, by their skulls. Why didn't they do that? Why don't they just say, count every male by their skulls? No, what it's saying is individuals, and you count heads. And so that's why they say that. Every time, not every time, 
There's a couple of places where it's talking, it uses the word pull in the Old Testament, and it's talking about cutting your hair. Well, but it's from the head, right? So it has to do with head, but it's a different word. This is the word Golgoleth, which is translated as Golgotha, the place of a skull. Look at one more in the Old Testament. Go to Exodus 16. Exodus chapter 16, and look at verse number 16. This is talking about the time when the when we looked at it last uh, week, I believe, about the manna. Uh, here it says, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. Gather of it, that's the manna, every man according to his eating, and omer for every man according to the number of your persons. Take ye every man for them uh, which are in his tents. The words every man is Golgoleth. You wouldn't see it in, in, in English, would you? But that's talking about every person, every head, every man, uh, take the, uh, the manna. So the Golgotha Gol Gol and Calvary are the same place, only Calvary is the, uh, from the Latin, which is translation of the Greek cranion, and Golgotha is the Hebrew word that means a skull. And so in each of those verses we read, and I'm not, I'm not going to take you back there, Matthew 27, 33, Mark 15, 22, and John 19, 17, in each of those places when it says, uh, which is the place of a skull, that word skull could be translated Calvary. But it wouldn't make any sense to you, would it? The place called Gotha, which is, which is the place of Calvary. Because Calvary is a skull. So we know now that Golgotha and Calvary are synonymous because they are the place, or it is the place, where Jesus was uh, crucified. Go over to Hebrews chapter 13. And as I said, that place where Jesus was crucified was outside of Jerusalem. And there was a, a reason for that. And it was a biblical, or a, a, a godly reason God had it planned that way. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 12. Now, the book of Hebrews is explaining to the Jewish people. That's why it's called the book of Hebrews. It's explaining to the Jewish people, looking back at their Old Testament law and the procedures that the priests had to go through in the temple to sacrifice the offerings and he's and the writer is comparing those sacrifices and all of that procedure of the Old Testament to what God has done in Jesus Christ and showing that what Christ has done is so much easier and better than what God had planned for the Jewish people back then it was all a picture of what Jesus was going to do and so he says because of those pictures this is what God did in Jesus Christ Verse number 12, wherefore, or, be, or uh, so because of this, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Now that word without throws us off, I think, for a lot of, a lot of people when they read it. I can't understand the Bible. I can't understand because the words are so weird. Well, get used to it. It's, it's easy to get uh, once you, once you, uh, I, you know, I grew up reading these things. So it's not hard. Uh, maybe I, I um, had to think about it, but without does not mean I'm missing something. Jesus didn't, uh, wasn't crucified not having a gate, <laughs> without a gate. Outside, without, outside is what it means. So he was crucified outside the gate of Jerusalem because the Old Testament sacrifices, they would take the carcasses of the animals outside of the camp or outside of Jerusalem and burn them there. And so Jesus fulfilled that when he was crucified outside uh, the, uh, the city of Jerusalem on a cross at the place of a skull. 
Now, how much can I preach on Calvary and, and Golgotha? That's about it, okay? And I'm not going to stop, though. I'm going to go on to what another word that happened, and not the word happened, another word about something that happened while Jesus was on the cross. And that was the darkness. And I want to look at the word darkness also today. So look again at Matthew chapter 27. Remember that when Jesus was uh, on the cross, the Bible tells us that there was darkness over the land for three hours before he died. Matthew chapter 27. And look at verse number 45. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Here we see Jesus, uh, this darkness that was over the land. Don't, I, I, I know they've made a lot of movies, and I remember seeing one movie, I don't know how long ago it was, many years. I don't like watching them because they, they what they say, they take liberties. In, uh, I, I don't even want to watch the Ten Commandments anymore. Uh, but uh, I, I was watching one movie, and when Jesus died on the cross to illustrate this darkness, they had clouds cover up the sun, and then they had a storm. So it rained. The Bible says nothing about rain. It doesn't say anything about clouds. And it doesn't say how the sun was darkened, but God brought darkness over the land. And there's a reason, I believe, for this darkness. And it was to illustrate the evil that was being paid for. What Jesus went through on the cross. This darkness. Remember... In Exodus chapter 20, the Bible tells us that uh, there was darkness in the land. One of the judgments of, uh, I'm not, I said 20, it's Exodus chapter 10. I thought about 20. Wait a minute. 20 is where the Ten Commandments are. They're already out of Egypt. Exodus chapter 10 is one of the, uh, the plagues that God brought on Egypt was darkness over the land. Over the, the land of Egypt where the Egyptians were, but not over the land where the, the, uh, the Jewish people were. They had light, but the Egyptians had to go through this darkness for three days. And the Bible says it was a darkness that could be felt. Have you ever felt darkness? You know, it, a darkness where there's just total darkness, it's not something that you can reach out and feel like this, but you feel it inside. It's, it's wrong because we have eyes. And so when we lose our eyes, that's, that's what makes it very difficult for a blind, a person who goes blind. They know what light is. They know the, the recognition of being able to see. And that, and I've said it other times, this is just amazing to me that, that God can make this little thing up here, two of them here, and make me see where I'm going. That's amazing. I, if, you don't, if you're not amazed about it, Get to know God better because it's, it just doesn't, doesn't make any human sense. I don't, I don't know how evolutionists can even think like that, that it just happened. Slowly but surely over billions of years, God created us to be able to see light. And so he uses the illustration of darkness and light to show how, how much different he is light than we are. Darkness. Because we, without Christ, are in darkness. Now, we can see with our eyes, but our hearts are darkened without Christ. And this is what is illustrated when Jesus took our sins upon himself on the cross. Even though the darkness of the Egyptians was a serious darkness to them. It said that, that they, they stayed in their place. <laughs> it was so dark that they couldn't go anywhere. Apparently, they couldn't even light their lamps. They didn't get up from their place to go anywhere. I, I, when Moses came and talked to Pharaoh in the darkness, I've wondered about this. 
Was there just this shaft of light on Moses and Aaron as they walked up to, Mo up to Pharaoh? I don't know. Maybe it was just that they could see and nobody else could. Maybe God just made everybody blind. And so to them it was darkness. A lot of things I, we don't know. But the darkness, now that was serious. But the darkness that was on Jesus Christ, the darkness at the time Christ died, was even more serious. Because Jesus experienced something that the Egyptians could never experience. Jesus experienced the sin on him. And the sin that was on him was unbelievable. We can't, we can't imagine. Go over to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, and look at verse number 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Of all of us. He says of us all. Who's he talking about? He's talking about every person for all time. For all places. Go over to the book of 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. and Look at verse number 2. The word propitiation means satisfaction. God is satisfied. And he is the propitiation for our sins. Now, who, who, who is John talking to and with? He's talking to Christians. He's talking to Christians, of, and, and he's including himself there. He says, um, he is, God, Christ is the propitiation for our sins. God is satisfied that our sins are paid for on Christ. But then he goes on, he says, but not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We've looked at the word holy. Uh, this morning in Sunday school. What does the word holy mean? Completely. So the whole world means the complete world. He's not limiting it to his time or anything. It's all of the people of all time, all sin. And when you consider yourself and your sin, if you could sit down and you could number your sins, you would be amazed at how many sins that Christ paid for for you. But you multiply that by... I don't know, let's say 16 billion. That's a lot of sin. But it was all on Christ. And so he was carrying our sin. And so what did God do to show what he was doing on Christ? Brought darkness over the land to illustrate all of the sin on Jesus for all people for all time. It represents the judgment of God. God allowed Jesus Christ to be punished for us. He received God's judgment, God's punishment. And that is a very serious and fearful, I'd say, thing to receive God's punishment, His judgment. Go back to Isaiah again and look at chapter 13. God had to judge and punish Israel. And he tells them at times what he's going to do and what he has to do and why. And we should praise the Lord that when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are not recipients of his punishment. He has mercy. And he offers us grace. We looked at those words recently. Look at John, Isaiah 13. Look at verse number 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger. Now, think about it. Is, is, G, is God cruel? No. But it's, he's coming with judgment. He's coming with punishment. And it's, it calls it cruel because that's the way people take it. But God is love. To lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Now listen, listen to what he says. We're talking about darkness now. 
For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. Man, that sounds, <laughs> that sounds bad. Do we, are we going to be there? Are we going to experience that? No. Why? Now some people are going to experience that because they have not accepted the, the fact that Jesus paid for their sin on the cross. We as Christians are not going to experience that. We have put our faith in Jesus Christ because Jesus experienced that for us. God's wrath was poured out on Jesus Christ, illustrated by the darkness. And here it points out there's not, not going to be light from the sun or the moon or the stars. It's going to be a dark day for those people who have never trusted Christ. Not just that day, but eternity. It's going to be dark for eternity. People, people have said that uh, the lake of fire must not be uh, must not be darkness because fire brings light. <laughs> how can any any person who knows the Bible enough? How can they say God? Because what they're saying is God can't make fire that's dark. No, God can do anything, right? No. He can't. Did you know that? God can't do everything. He can't lie. God can't sin. Okay, so God can do anything that's within His nature. Okay? And He can make fire without light. Darkness is a symbol of misery. It's a symbol of... We've, we've talked about the word woe. Woe to them that do this. Woe to me if I don't do this. What does woe mean? Well, it's a miserable condition. So darkness represents misery and woe. Go over to Psalm 107. Psalm 107, verse number 10. Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death, and break their bands in sunder. Now, let me stop there. I'm going to read verse 15 too, but think about what he's saying. He says, they sat in darkness they, because they rebelled against the words of God, and he brought their heart down with labor. He, they were miserable. It was an, an uneasy, if you want to, that's probably a, a uh, not very strong of a word. They were uneasy. They were miserable. But he brought them out of that. He brought them out of the darkness. Why? Because of his mercy, because of his grace. Verse 15. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. God brings us out of misery, brings the light to us, because God is light, John tells us. Darkness is a symbol of misery. Whoa, darkness is also a symbol of ignorance. Ignorance and a symbol of sin. Look over at uh, 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. <clears throat> and look at verse number 11. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth, because the darkness hath blinded his eyes. Now, he's not talking about a physical blindness. He's talking about the eyes of our understanding. 
He's saying this person who is hating his brother is still living in his old way. He is not allowing the light of God, the light of Jesus Christ, to give him the understanding that he shouldn't feel that way toward his brother. He that hateth his brother is still in darkness and walks in darkness. Go over to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse number 19. He said that dark, darkness is the symbol of ignorance and sin. Ignorance. Here it's, he says, the way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. They don't know what they're stumbling at because they're ignorant. They're still in darkness. They don't understand God's way. Now, can Christians still walk in darkness? Yes. Now, I'm going to give you an example, and I know that examples are just like that, examples, and uh, it's hard sometimes to find a good example. I'm going to give you one about liars, okay? Some people say, I know God, and I know what God wants, and I, and I, I live for the Lord. But, and when they sin, they sometimes don't see it as sin. They don't recognize it because they're ignorant in that darkness. They're allowing the darkness to come. Now, it happens to Christians, and we know it happens to non-Christians because they're always in darkness. But a Christian can think like this. Now, I'm going to give you this example. <clears throat> God doesn't like liars. God doesn't like lying, I should say that. He loves the liar. Not when he lies, okay, but not because he lies, but he doesn't like lying. Jesus said, uh, the devil is a liar and he's the father of it. So a liar is a child of the devil. So here's a Christian man sitting at the dinner table and uh, he's eating his wife's cooking and he's miserable because it tastes terrible. Now this, this talks to both the husband and wife, okay, because uh, wives be very careful when you ask questions. How do you like it, honey? Well, if he's a good husband, and the food's bad, what's he supposed to do? <laughs> well, sweetheart, I've had better. We've got to learn how to say things tactfully. It's hard, guys. Women, it's hard for you, too. Uh, if you ask the husband about something, and he'd, or if the husband asks you about something, and you're not thrilled with it. Um, but what if the man says, just because he doesn't want to hurt her feelings, oh, it's good. And inside he's thinking, this is the worst stuff that I've ever tasted. What did he just do? He lied. But he's trying to save his wife's feelings. Is that a lie? Was God glorified through what the man said? No. So yeah, it's, it's hard sometimes. But lying, we, we know that it is against God. And so when we lie and try to excuse it, and I'm not talking about big lies. It, it, they, the world talks about a white lie. That's like, that's like calling a, a witch good, okay? There are no good witches. And there are no white lies or good lies. God says not to lie. And if we lie and try to excuse it, we are still walking in darkness. Ladies, as I said, if that happens, uh, if you ask the question, be prepared, okay? And learn not to be offended when they tell you the truth because God wants them to tell you the truth. So if you really want the truth, either don't ask anything or ask and expect. You can taste it too, you know. But see, my wife tastes things and I don't like what she likes all the time. So anyway, don't walk in darkness. John tells us that God is light. And in him is what? No darkness? What does he add to that? At all. It's like he's saying, don't even think 
that there's a little bit. Everybody knows what that yin yang symbol is on the Korean flag. Anybody? Everybody know, recognize it? Looks like two fish, head to tail. Okay, but if you look closely, there's a in the in the white. I'll say fish. I don't know what they call it. The tadpole. In the white, there's a black dot, and in the black one, there's a white dot. They're saying in in all good, there's a little bit of evil, and in all bad, there's a little bit of good. Uh uh, not with God. God is all good, all the time, everywhere. There is no darkness in Him at all. Go over to Colossians chapter 1. Remember John also told us in John chapter 1, the light, Jesus Christ, shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Those of us who are in the light, we are really, and we stay in the light, the darkness cannot overpower us. If we continue to walk with Christ, depending on Christ, seeking God's will at all times, we remain in the light and we have God's understanding. Go over to Colossians 1, look at verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Look at he says, He has delivered us from the power or authority of darkness. That word power is that exousia. It's the, it's the authority of darkness. When we put our faith in Christ, we are free. God delivers us from the authority of the sin and darkness that is around us and in us. We are freed and, and, and just out of the bondage. So we have the ability to not sin. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5. Uh, let's just start at verse number uh, 1. But of the times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. See, we, have, we who know Jesus Christ, we recognize Christ is returning, and we can watch for him. And that day should not surprise us because we know He's coming. We know He's returning. And when it happens, praise the Lord. Don't be, oh! I remember when I was in church one time. I've told you this. I won't tell you again. Yeah, I will tell you because maybe some of you haven't heard it. I was in church when I was in high school. I was probably as freshman. Maybe I was in eighth grade. I'm not sure. But uh, the, 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 the preacher must have been preaching about uh, uh, the rapture. And uh, I must have not been listening, or I was thinking myself about the rapture. My eyes were closed. It was the invitation time, and I had my eyes, my, my head down, my eyes closed. But you know how, you, how it happens when your eyes are closed and somebody shines a light on you? Well, I was, had my eyes closed, and I was thinking of the rapture. <laughs> and I wasn't hearing him, and he said, everybody have everybody stand. I didn't realize it. And so it, with my eyes closed, everything went darker. <gasps> I thought it was the rapture. I thought it happened right then. I just because it's just dark, even with my eyes closed. I wasn't ready. I was ready. I was saved, but it just caught me off guard. No, we should not be caught off guard when Christ comes because we should be watching. We are not in darkness. Those who do remain in darkness without the light. Uh, can't do the things that God approves of. They're slaves to sin. That's why he tells us that we are uh, out of that bondage, out of that power when we put our faith in Christ. The worst darkness that anybody can ever experience is what the Bible calls outer darkness. Outer darkness is the place, the lake of fire. 
God's going to judge even according to his goodness. Now, some people would say that, that oh, if God is good, he's not going to send people to hell for eternity. And that's why we're, we're looking at this uh, seventh, uh, we looked at the Seventh-day Adventists. They believe the same kind of thing as the Jehovah's Witnesses, almost like what even the Mormons believe. Uh, we'll look at that eventually. But they don't believe that God has people in hell or the lake of fire for all eternity. But when you think of the goodness of God, we know that He is infinitely good. He is righteous. In His goodness, He judges those who sin against Him. And it doesn't matter if a person is just the mi minor, minute sin that we would consider small. It's infinitely evil against the goodness of God. And so he is perfectly righteous in having a person end up in hell who has never trusted Christ. You know what? God gave Jesus Christ to pay the penalty of my sin. If I reject Christ, and I haven't, but if I had rejected Christ when I died, I am, I am sending myself to that eternity in a lake of fire. Whose fault is it? God's? No. See, the lake of fire wasn't created for mankind. It was created for the devil and his angels. But God must send people there because they reject Jesus Christ. They don't accept the fact that Christ paid their penalty. Go over to... Revelation 21. Revelation 21 and verse number 8. But the fearful and unbelieving... Now, the unbelieving is everybody, every one of these people he mentions... Okay. Fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. God's judgment is righteous. He gives all men the opportunity to trust Him. He gives all men the same, I'll say it this way, chance too. The opportunity to accept Christ. To accept by faith what God has provided in the salvation. So nobody has an excuse. If they're in darkness, they can get out of it by coming to Christ. God loves all people. Remember, while the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God gave Jesus Christ not to good people. He gave Jesus Christ to pay the penalty of bad people. And that included you and me. God did that for us. Jesus went through an infinite punishment. You might not think it's infinite punishment, but remember who was on the cross. God Himself in the flesh. And so His death paid for everybody and it was an infinite punishment. He went through that darkness that nobody else could ever feel. He did that. He died at a place called Calvary, Golgotha, the place of a skull. He did it for you and me. He did it for all people. And those people who accept Him have eternal life, and those people who reject Him have eternal damnation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your gift of salvation to all who believe. And Lord, as Jesus pointed out, that he came to save sinners. He didn't come to condemn. Lord, all people are condemned already until they put their faith in Christ. We're condemned because of our sin. But Lord Jesus paid for the sin and so the only reason anyone would go to an eternal lake of fire is because they reject the gift of the infinite punishment of Jesus Christ. Thank you for Jesus going through that darkness 
at the place called Calvary. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.